Okay, hello everyone and hope everyone is having a great day so far. Uh, welcome to the series titled Negotiating Digital Space in Culturally Significant Storytelling, which is a cross-cultural and interdisciplinary webinar series co-curated by Katie Graham and myself, Pallavi Swaranjali. It is organized by the Canadian Center for Mindful Habitats in association with the Bachelor of Media Production and Des Design Program Uh, School of Journalism at Carleton University and the Bachelors of Interior Design Program Algonquin College, both in Ottawa. The seven part webinar series supported by a Shirk sure Connection grant, uh, Art Engine and Carleton Immersive Media Studio runs from June 16th to Ju July 28th, 2022, and it will explore a multifaceted concept of storytelling and how digital technology is expanding on the storytelling toolkit. While digital tools bring new ways to tell stories and remove limitations of access, a multitude of ethical and technical issues arise, such as those of ownership, appropriation, inclusion, and dissemination. In negotiating digital space, we pose the opening questions. What role can digital storytelling play when contemplating the promotion and preservation of oral traditions of knowledge transfer? Can the digital create a parallel space for storytelling and its impact on the roles of the author, narrator, reader, storyteller, and story keeper? What are the frameworks within which stories operate and what happens when the digital tools are put to play? What dimensions are added with the introduction of culturally significant and diverse forms of storytelling? In the seven sessions which this webinar series presents, these questions and others will be explored through conversations with invited speakers from diverse fields within academia and industry. So today we have the privilege of welcoming two of our very esteemed guests, um, Mario Santana and Stephen Inglis. Um, welcome both. Uh, today's session is titled Ownership of the Materiality of Stories. Uh, and Here we will discuss how stories can be shared through material objects such as culturally significant artifacts, uh, digital documentation of heritage spaces. And to ensure the stories connected to materials of place aren't eroded over time, documentation works through photogrammet photogrammetry, sorry, uh, laser sc scanning and computer modeling, which have become common practices. So we We ask how, who owns the digital archives that become an extension of the material storytelling of place. In this webinar, um, Mario discusses the ethical dilemmas on data ownership associated with documentation of foreign heritage sites. And S Stephen reflects on the use of museums and cultural centers in Northern indigenous communities as sites for reviving and preserving storytelling. I would like to welcome Katie to introduce our speakers. Katie. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, so um, as Pallavi said, what this session is about, we have two um, fantastic guests, Mario Santana and Stephen Inglis. I'm going to um, introduce both of them and then I'm going to pass um, over the, um, the floor to Mario and then he'll be followed by Stephen before we move to questions um, and discussion. Um, so first, Mario Santana uh, Quintero is a civil environmental engineering professor cross appointed with the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism at Carleton University. He is the director of the NSERC CREATE program, Heritage Engineering, and a Carleton Immersive Media Studio faculty member. Besides his academic work in Canada, he is a guest professor at the Raymond Lemaire International Center for Conservation. Um, and then along with his active, academic activities, he serves as Secretary General of the International Council of Monumental and Sites, um, also known as ICOMOS. He is one of ICOMOS Science Committee, um, Scientific Committee on Heritage Documentation um, and President, um, Heritage Documentation President at SIPA. 
He has collaborated in several international projects and heritage documentation for the Getty Conservation Institute, UNESCO, among others. In recent years, he was a Getty scholar and he was awarded a, a doctorate honoris causa from the University of Liege in Belgium and membership of the Associate Preservation Technology College of Fellows. So very excited to have Mario here today. Um, and to join him in conversation is Stephen Inglis. Stephen Inglis was executive director of the Anishakmik uh, Cree Cultural Institute from 2010 until 2015. Before joining um, this leading First Nations organization, he was researcher, curator, and then director general of research and collections at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, responsible for the content area of Canada's National Museum of Ethnology and History. During this time, he helped create an international reputation for the museum and developed an extensive network of national and, over, um, and overseas partners, leading to major acquisitions and traveling exhibitions. He contributed extensively to the museum's research and collections of folk and popular art, fine craft, and ethnic studies. Since completing his PhD in anthropology at the University of British Columbia, Stephen Inglis has taught both anthropology and art history at Carleton. And since 2015, he has been closely involved with the Curatorial Studies program. So thank you very much both Stephen Inglis and Mario Santana for being here today. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and pass the floor over to, to Mario who will begin with um, his presentation um, to prompt the discussion after Stevens. Thank you, Katie. Let me just uh, share my presentation. Okay. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes, yes, I guess yes. <laughs> so thank you, Katie and, and Pallavi for this opportunity to, to share some of my experience in this field of, you know, ethics and, and digital assets uh, for protecting heritage places. And also, I'm very thrilled to share this panel with Steve, and I hope that we have a great conversation after we, we both speak of our experience. So uh, basically, I, I would emphasize a little bit of what the digital technologies deal with presentation. So presentation is the way in which something is offered, shown, explained, etc., to others. So very simple, very simple definition, right? Um, before we go further, you know, digital space and assets of historic places. So it's my strong belief that digital assets produced by information technologies should inform and should contribute to the protection of historic places. And that's, that's my personal view. Digital assets should offer opportunities to historic places, such as, you know, be monitored for their preservation and others, but specifically to the topic of this uh, webinar, to storytelling. Producing digital assets should be affordable to historic uh, places, sites, custodians, and communities. Otherwise, we fail into you know, the trap of uh, having technologies which is not really utilized. And digital assets should offer opportunities to communities to participate in, in the ongoing conservation efforts of historic places. And digital assets should transcend over time. I don't plan to answer all these questions, but I just wanted to kind of uh, set the stage for, for some of the messages. So the production of a, of a digital asset for historic places involves several phases, planning, acquisition, processing, dissemination, maybe some simulation, presentation, archival. And in all these phases, we have all these kind of intellectual, you know, going into the different uh, steps to produce. So ownership of a digital asset is a very difficult question to be answered which kind of process our intellectual uh, contribution goes along uh, as we digitize and we present those, uh, those sites in the using technologies. What are the common heritage actors in this activity? Well, we have academia, government, for-profit, intergovernmental organizations, not-for-profit partnerships and research projects like the one we were just mentioning, you know, this negotiating digital spaces project is a kind of research slash uh, partnership and not-for-profit activity. Uh, actually, the, the issue of ethics came to me in 2016. I have an extensive experience in recording historic sites across the world, but I, I brought my students to Myanmar uh, to the site of Bagan, and we were uh, accompanied by, by a foundation that provided some support and scanned some of the sites. Uh, this, this organization, which is actually quite good and very relevant internationally, they developed a 3D portal in Google Earth and Culture 
to expose the qualities of this historic site. But unfortunately, because some kind of miscommunication did not ask the, the permission of organizations, of the local organization in Myanmar. And this caused a big revolt because as we you know, produce digital assets, we have to see that it's not only, not only putting on our website very nicely and promoting the site is it, fine. We also need to have a participatory process in which the actually uh, community and site custodians of these particular uh, heritage places are involved in the, throughout the entire process. So I thought, well, this is, you know, this is a cool animation of, of, of this site in Myanmar, and you can, you can have a look uh, uh, to the website in Google Arts and Culture. But what is actually this activity contributing to the conservation of this site? So I also see a big disconnect between the digital representations and how do they contribute to the site. So what are the questions in when we relate to the ethics of, of information of digital assets in presenting sites? Who owns the information? And we were talking about ownership, which is not a, something that we, are, we will be able to answer today, I guess. How to keep and transmit the information? How can the heritage recording process be transparent? How we collect the data and how we present it? Uh, do we need to share the technology and collaborate to make it more affordable? Do we need to commit to provide training? That's something that I'm very highly committed. I'm actually now in Italy doing some training of, of Italian and other students. Uh, from my experience in Canada? And do we need to share our knowledge to others? So if we look at the ethical categories, in my research, I conducted some assessment and I looked into the ICOMOS and into the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. And I found six categories of ethical commitments when it comes to, to collecting digital assets for sites. One is to the conduct of the expert collecting the data that he has to prevail with the best approaches to do it. And that relates to best practices. So if we are going to collect data and produce files, we need to provide our clients and our custodians what are the different options. We need to respect the cultural heritage of the site. We need to respect the public and communities that we serve. We need to be collegial to other heritage recording specialists working in the production of digital assets. And we need to have the qualifications. I, I believe this should be a democratization of technology, but I do believe that in our particular field, we need to acquire those qualifications that help us develop. Now, heritage is under, uh, under CH. We see abandonment, climate change, development, visitor pressures, neglect, disaster, and conflict. And actually, presentation can offer great opportunities to be able to uh, do this. And then the pandemic also caused other issues, like, you know, basically the lack of accessibility to sites. And the technology proved to be very interesting in providing that kind of remote access while we were in the lockdown and also to monitor sites that were uh, left abandoned because the tenants, the site custodians could not go there and care. There were about 90% of the World Heritage sites that were partially or completely closed during the COVID crisis. Uh, just a little bit about ICOMOS because I, I find this very relevant. It's an advisory committee to the World Heritage Convention, a non-for-profit organization of 10,000 plus members. I am the Secretary General, and we offer the opportunity for people to exchange uh, knowledge and, uh, and, and other things. Also relevant to the discussion today is the ICOMOS Charter on Interpretation and Presentation, or the NAME Charter, that was established for the interpretation and presentation of cultural heritage sites. And it talks a bit about the facilitate the understanding of, of appreciation of sites, communicate the meaning, safeguard the, the tangible and intangible values of sites, respect the authenticity, contribute to the sustainable conservation of the site, encourage inclusiveness, and develop a technical and professional guidelines for the use of these activities. And you can see these are the seven pillars of the, of the um, Enamet Charter principles. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I think that actually today we're going to talk a bit also and throughout these seminars, we're going to talk about the concern of inclusiveness, access and understanding, and that deals a lot with the issue of ethics. So in a presentation strategy, in particular of a word headed site, we have to see that sites are an inherent spatial phenomenon that is characterized by location, distribution, and scale. Also, we have setting components and attributes, and uh, these attributes and features can be also intangible. And a presentation can also raise awareness on the attributes that are threatened by the site. 
And today, based on the technology, it's no longer a one-way communication between the person that is doing the presentation or the digital assets, because now we can go both ways and how we can take advantage of that. So the traditional visit of sites uh, with, by train tours and guides and panels is now being replaced, you know, by, by technology. How can we not, do not compromise the understanding and the quality of that uh, particular site? A, a visitor experience uh, with digital assets should be conducted by an interdisciplinary group of experts and digital technologies provide good opportunities but the local communities should benefit also from sharing their knowledge as guides. So maybe we should complement, you know, also the, the digital storytelling with enhancing the role of traditional tour guides and, and other activities. A presentation infrastructure requires, you know, inter in interpretive infrastructure facilities and uh, new technologies offer more affordable ways of doing this. But regardless of that, they also uh, require a high intensive uh, uh, capacity to be able to produce it. So when we use technologies, we need to, to understand that we need to adopt, uh, we need to develop principles, guidelines, and protocols. We need to try see if digital technologies can amplify the capacity to present the site. If we had adopted digital technologies, we should consider the collective view of stakeholders, the topology, the amount of digital material available, uh, offer universal access to, to other people that naturally didn't have the feeling of, or, the ex, or the opportunity to go to sites and also look at what kind of digital infrastructure is available locally and the capacity and the funding available for those uh, site custodians and, and organizations that are adopting the digital tools. So in digital assets, we have media platforms and the assets itself. In the digital media, we can find, you know, very single files such as PDFs up to active virtual reality. Uh, to produce those, those media store assets, uh, we have digital cameras, drones, scanners, and surveying instruments. And then we, to visualize, we have three-dimensional visualization tools as, such as Google Cardboard, Oculus Go, Oculus Quest, Mixed Reality, etc. These devices allow to to access. So in the digital tools for recording, we have different sensors, cameras, uh, this is scanners, photogrammetry, et cetera. For visualization, as I said, we have the HoloLenses, for instance, this is called mixed reality, or we have, you know, the, the normal Oculus uh, virtual reality. Um, so as I said, uh, if we emphasize on the issues of presentation, of technologies, we can use different interfaces and platforms such as physical displays, social media, websites, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, in terms of virtual tour platforms, we can you know, create uh, a virtual experience in which people can interactively access the information of the site. And uh, with other technologies so, such as augmented reality and mixed reality, we can actually interact, have the user, the visitor interacting with different informations and creating such a platform in which, and, and eventually we can also provide the opportunity to share different uh, multiple storytelling venues of, in the understanding of the particular site. So um, I'm just going to skip this slide. Uh, I think that the sustainability of virtual sites is also important. Uh, now it's e really easy to communicate using the internet, but accessibility to broadband and quality visualizations is still challenging. And then also this type of very sophisticated visualizations, would they be uh, readable in the future? So as I said, just to reiterate, we have these five basic ethical categories and we have these opportunities and threats. Uh, Digital assets should not become the, mon the monument to be preserved. The site is still the, the place that needs to be preserved. We should not use this terminology of digital preservation or conservation, saying that, that a digital asset actually replaces the, the, the physical aspect of the site or intangible values. We should not practice the digital colonialism, me as a Canadian going somewhere, collecting data and then Owning, owning that data without the permission from other uh, stakeholders. The longevity and the digital records and transmission to present and future generations should be assured to a certain degree. And interpretation and transparency and usage should be evident in any of the technologies. So some important obligations, just to reiterate, we need to produce high quality records. We need to raise the awareness 
best and shorter transmission of information to present uh, to future generations, procedural transparency when producing the records, sharing technology and collaborating to make it more affordable, commit to provide training and capacity and participate in exchanges as we are doing now in this webinar. So in the ethical conduct, as I said, we need to you know, reiterate that we, uh, the Heritage Information Technology team should commit to showing respect, integrity, impartiality, and accountability when conducting their activities of digital. Uh, we need to provide opportunities for best practices uh, to offer our clients what are the best options for, for visualization and presentation. We should have a profound respect for the values and integrity of cultural sites. We should respect the public and the communities that we serve, privacy rights of communities and the right to control how knowledge about their heritage is shared is of paramount importance. We need to have the required skills and qualifications to conduct this kind of work. And if especially, and I look up on, you know, Katie's and Pallavi's teaching, probably certification in the storytelling is really needed. And, I, and I'm very happy, you know, that, that this course that Katie and Palavi are offering and this opportunity. Now we have some other emerging tools uh, that are appearing and how does this threaten this, this type of, of technology? I, I actually just want to step to this slide. I was, a, I, given that I'm in Italy, I'm using my uh, iPhone 13 Pro and I was able to capture this kind of vault a historic vault in the city of Parma. So eventually with uh, 3D phones, you, with LiDAR and so on, we are able to digitize sites in no time. So basically the interaction of, you know, me as a user, as a person equipped with an equipment capable of making three-dimensional models, what are the ethical challenges? So I haven't posted this anywhere. I collected it for my own, uh, uh, enjoyment and then to share it maybe with my students, but I don't plan to share it with other people because I don't have the permission from these uh, from these people in this site. But I think that new portable acquisition devices are probably one of the most challenging things that are happening. So what are the next steps? Certainly we should create a framework to meet ethical practices, introducing digital assets for, from uh, heritage sites. We should define the skills required to, to have you know, this inclusive digital storytelling connecting with the citizens. We should develop uh, technologies for historic sites presentations that are purpose built, because nowadays we use mostly products that are there for other purposes. And how would the international community at large assist with the application of these ethical principles. So I think that with this, I'm going to close because I don't wanna take all, all, all Steve's time and I'm looking forward to listen to him now. So, so thanks again, and, and this is all for me. So thank you very much, Mario. Um, I do have uh, a few questions, but we're gonna hold off on that until we have uh, Stephen as well talk. Um, so for Stephen's presentation, um, uh, I will share my screen for the first little bit for, to show um, a website, which I'll post the link in the chat, hold on. All right, um, so give me a second and then afterwards I'll stop sharing my screen so then you can, uh, then Stephen will be able to take the full screen to communicate and, and talk. Give me a second. I believe you're seeing the website. So if you don't, let me know and I'm going to pass the floor over to Stephen. Stephen, you are muted probably. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, I recommend this website to you because it's been created within the context of the institution itself. Uh, I felt that Mario gave us a very broad and very comprehensive look at uh, digital assets over uh, on a global scale. And I'm going to focus back in on a very local uh, situation. If you look at the uh, picture that was just up on the screen, you see a building. This is the Cree Cultural Institute, of which uh, 
I was executive director for the construction period and the first couple of years of uh, operation. And I wanted to say that storytelling in this context, which is a, a First Nations community, uh, nine, nine hours drive north of Ottawa um, in this institution, um, there are stories that continue on in a traditional way that is uh, over the firelight at night uh, in hunting camps in the winter time particularly. But I'm going to point to a few uh, possibilities and uh, continuing um, interventions of storytelling in a modern institution, which is this Cree Cultural Institute, which is, um, by the way, uh, owned and operated by the people themselves in this uh, tradition. These are people that were formerly called the Cree of James Bay, and now they're the EU of Iuischi. Uh, EU is the name of their community, and Iuischi is uh, one third approximately of Quebec, which is the land over which they have. Um, control. Um, first of all, I want to mention the architecture of the building, as you see there. Um, there's an element in the infrastructure of the building itself, which lends itself to storytelling. That is, we created a building which mimicked uh, the structure of traditional Cree uh, buildings. And uh, so there are little elements everywhere which play off uh, traditional buildings. And this makes people who come to this institution more comfortable with it. So the Cree themselves love this building and partly because when they're inside of it, they feel that it respects and in some ways mimics uh, the kind of architecture that they're familiar with, especially in the countryside. Um, the second element, which was very important to the operation of the building, was that we created a space right at the entrance, right inside the entrance door for elders. Now, elders move around in this community and they come here and they sit. So there's comfortable chairs, but it's right at the entrance to the building. So everyone who goes in the main door sees these elders. If they're Cree, they go over and say hello, sometimes give a hug, have a little chat. It's as if the elders are welcoming people to the building. And this generates a sense of interaction, uh, which is uh, very much part of an older tradition of uh, storytelling. Now, I'll move quickly on to the exhibitions. Um, what we did in these exhibitions is we introduced, um, because the labels in the exhibitions are in Cree, French, and English, um, there's not much room to go further than that. So we put QR codes on every label and introduced longer stories by the elders, which people could download immediately on their phones. So uh, everybody with a cell phone, and that's almost everybody, including the Cree, uh, as they went in, if they were interested in a particular object, they could immediately have access to stories by elders talking about that object. And that added a whole dimension um, to the uh, exhibition places. We put places to sit in the exhibitions. Now, this is something that, you know, is used more or less in, in many museums, including big colonial and settler museums. But in this one, it was particularly important because they could sit and listen for longer periods of time to the elders talking about the objects and their, their own experience with objects. We also built a small uh, structure within the exhibit where people could feel comfortable sitting there and listening and looking at images and also uh, digital uh, films of elders talking. Moving on to the collections. These are just categories within a museological framework. In the collections, 
Um, first of all, I want to say that um, oral history has often been looked at, even by anthropologists, but certainly by many other people, as a kind of a, a secondary form of history. A secondary, I mean, the idea of an orally transmitted uh, tradition was thought to be part mythology and you know not very reliable and so forth. This was a, a common idea. But uh, subsequent research and continuing uh, development of respect for other people's traditions have shown that oral history is in fact extremely detailed and can document uh, uh, things that took place, occurrences, from not only hundreds of years ago, but even thousands of years ago. And as a consequence of that, everyone who's working with culture has to take oral history uh, more seriously. And um, we do that in this institution, or we did that in this institution with uh, collections in the sense that every piece that we collected for this, the exhibition and for the collections was documented with people's stories. And we ran that out into the programming by reproducing key objects from the collections by very skilled seamstresses. And they worked in the entrance to the exhibit. So one woman, for example, reproduced a Cree hood, which is a, a head covering that women used to wear. No old woman alive remembers wearing it, but it was something from the 19th century that was quite common, highly beaded hoods. So a young woman who is a wonderful seamstress reproduced one of the hoods in the collection sitting there for over a year in the, in the front of the exhibit. Every woman who came in, every Cree woman would talk to her. And in this way, we gained amazing information about this, even though it was in a long lost uh, oral memory. We did the same with caribou skin coats that Cree hunters used to wear. These coats are highly decorated, beautiful coats uh, that hunters would go out in. Uh, it was partly a ritual and it's the opposite of camouflage. So instead of making themselves invisible in the forest, the hunters presented themselves in their most beautiful clothing so that they would show respect for the animals they were hunting and hopefully draw, the, draw those animals to them. So it, it's a completely different view uh, of dressing, but one that's recorded in people's stories and understanding. So we also had the, a uh, caribou skin coat being worked on in the front, everybody's comments and so forth were recorded. So this becomes part of the documentation of the collection. In other words, the Institute is developed to promote discussion and to record that discussion. And I, I should also say, and I'd forgotten to mention that in the exhibition, everyone uh, was offered a tablet so that an older person who had a story that they would like to share, this is visitors sharing their stories of objects, could record on the spot their thoughts, and those would go back into the documentation for the objects. Now, often they need a young person with them in order to operate the technology, but that's fine. A young person, an old person, and a tablet was a key to developing more authentic personal information about these objects. And finally, programming. What we were able to do uh, with the programming for the center is to develop a number of projects. And these move beyond the storytelling mode, but take stories, traditional stories, from the oral tradition and move them into drama which is a form that the Cree never used traditionally. But they decided to animate these stories in their own way. So they brought 
uh, Cree people who'd been involved in drama, Cree people who'd been involved in film, and they developed a script and a whole drama around some of these traditional stories and ideas. And they traveled that drama to all the 10 communities of the Cree around their territory, and then to a few nearby towns in the region. And uh, so these stories were, in a sense, enlivened in a completely new medium that um, caused uh, a lot of excitement, also some controversy, because people were seeing shape-shifting beasts and animals and people much closer together than they would be in ordinary life uh, being presented on stage. Some people didn't uh, like that. And of course, some people thought it was uh, extremely interesting. And uh, this kind of tension also develops uh, new kinds of dialogue and new kinds of storytelling. So I'll finish there. I simply wanted to um, say that colonial museums, which we're familiar with, ones like I worked in for 25 years, uh, have their uh, uses and capacities, they're changing and so forth. But in Northern communities with the new museums in the territory of indigenous people have a whole new set of possibilities for uh, enhancing their deep, deep uh, and so uh, critical uh, ideas that come from storytelling. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you both um, for some great, um, <clears throat> some two great presentations that both look at kind of different sides of how objects and materials can hold stories, but also how they can be used to share the, the oral stories. Um, so the, this part of the webinar, um, what we hope is for uh, more of a dialogue and conversation between Stephen and Mario, but to kind of prompt that, um, I'll ask uh, the first question. Um, like from myself. Um, uh, so the question is um, kind of about the, um, the involvement of the community in the storytelling. And both of you talked about that in different ways. So for Mario, it was about the training and having um, people from the community help participate. And for Stephen, um, the idea of the iPads as well to add to it. Um, and um, I guess I just want to know more about that from both of you, about how um, how important is it to to expand the the narrative and the story of the documentation and the sharing of the collection um, to to not just the curator or the the person collecting the data, and and how does that how does that influence and affect the the story and the capturing? Um, so I'll pass that question uh, or that prompt over to you guys, and I'll let you decide who to answer first. Steve, you want to go first? <laughs> oh, sure. I, I'll, I'll just uh, answer very quickly to that one. Um, part of the role of an uh, outside uh, person like myself uh, to an Indigenous institution is to assure that um, <clears throat> the uh, recruitment of uh, new staff and the training of staff is done with uh, members of the community. So that it, it comes right down to that is that everyone who works at that institution, um, with the exception of a few specialists that are brought in from time to time, are members of the local community. They're the ones who collect the stories. They're the ones who record the stories. They're the ones who make sure that uh, what Mario very uh, acutely called digital colonialism uh, doesn't take place anymore. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, for years and years, the Cree of this community were in conflict with Hydro-Quebec because Hydro-Quebec was building huge dams in their territory. First of all, without even acknowledging that they existed there. Uh, Andre Bourassa, the uh, premier of Quebec said, in this vast and empty land lie the future of the Quebecois. Now, what he meant by that 
was the Quebecois who were living south. And of course it was vast, but it wasn't empty. It, it had been occupied for 10,000 years. Uh, so um, it, what, what needed to change was the idea that people have to come in from the outside and they have to control the story. Hydro-Quebec sent dozens and dozens of anthropologists into that area. They recorded information about the traditional life of the people there and they took it back to Montreal. The people that were recorded never had any access to that material until just recently. Because they built a museum and an archive there, Hydro-Quebec finally agreed to return these recordings to the Cree. They never imagined doing that in the first place. They just wanted to find out more about the people who were in the way. So um, now uh, with people controlling their own stories and people controlling their own distribution of those stories, um, there is a, a great deal more authenticity uh, to the presentations and also a lot more vitality to it because everyone who visits this museum among the Cree and everyone who works there is engaged in the content in some way or another. They're not moving on to another project and leaving this in some archive or some, uh, some uh, place. Um, one of the biggest problems with, with big museums in Canada are the archives. They've collected huge amounts of data over the last 100, 150 years and have very little way of distributing it it either to the public or even to the people who originally generated it. And it's a huge problem for museums. They don't have the staff, they don't have the technology to do this. So um, for smaller Northern museums, it is possible to take every piece or hopefully every piece of recorded material and to think about what its use is, what its uh, scope is, and how it can be uh, a lively and integral part of the institution. Thank you. Yes, and I, I, I agree completely with Steve. I can give an example, you know, a little bit more international. So, you know, for instance, the Institut de Montarap in Paris uh, created this exhibition about Palmyra, Aleppo, and um, um, Mosul in Iraq. And they, they have these digital assets that were uh, surveyed by a French company. And they created this exhibition that traveled across the world in different places, showing the decay after the, you know, the conflict in those countries. But I mean, undoubtedly, this, you know, this actually, um, allow the countries to raise a lot of funding for the restoration of these places that were heavily damaged and contributed to the conservation, et cetera. But something that I don't think crossed the mind of people that were doing those exhibitions is that you are showing, you know, the deterioration and the damage of, of people's, uh, you know, dwellings in, unintentionally, right? And nobody thought that you know, what is the right of privacy of people that see their places being destroyed and what is their opinion? And there was no big exhibition in Damascus or, or, in, or in, in Baghdad about that uh, same exhibition. So basically they were never brought to the people that were affected. They were used as a mechanism to raise funding. And this is, you know, this is also what is happening with Ukraine and other places. So, I mean, it is our responsibility that we, that we, you know, kind of really go to the core of, of who is it that we're doing this for? Is it because we, you know, we have this World Heritage Site, which belongs to everyone and it's so important, you know, 
it transcends millions of years, or is it of today that is also important of the people that live there, that have their livelihood? And I think that people have never, many people, because of this intention of, you know, how digital technologies easily can disseminate knowledge, unintentionally do something to harm other people's feelings. And I think that other people's feelings should be, you know, should be taken into consideration. Um, I think that the word, you know, of digital uh, colonialism is one, one thing, also appropriation. So I think Steve was talking, you know, about the archives in museums. So these are appropriation, right, of knowledge. And these archives are in, in places that are basically not accessible for anyone. I, I had a visiting student um, that was looking into some particular sites in Canada. And basically you have to go physically to the archives in, in, in Canada, which is not a criticism to them to be able to access the information. So why is this information not somehow more available? Why are we not taking those digital, those, that, those archives, which are paper-based paper in Canada and we are transforming them into digital assets that can be shared by other people? Why do we not have this commitment? So, uh, I mean, those are questions. I, I think that, that Steve eloquently talked about indigenous communities and I, I, I would not claim to be an expert uh, on, on the aspects of, of the communities, but there's also so little to know, right? About what is happening in Canada. I am always impressed as I travel around that people don't know much about what happens to, to our First Nations in Canada. Right abroad. I mean, like it's a big discussion now among ourselves in, in, in our own country, but it doesn't happen elsewhere, right? Well, those, I, I thank you for that, Mario. Those, those are definitely the questions that we all have to ask. And the other thing is you mentioned uh, people's privacy and um, people's regard uh, for their own knowledge as a part of a cultural asset. And we have to understand if we're archivists or if we're, if we're working in concert or in collaboration with smaller uh, communities of people, we have to be conscious of the fact that the entire process of colonialism has been something that has um, endangered and also harmed uh, indigenous people. And so it's not as if we're starting from a, you know, a base of, of uh, reciprocity or something. No, that, that's not it at all. We're dealing with people who have had cultural material appropriated, that's the right word, uh, Mario, uh, repeatedly over the last few centuries. And they are harmed by that. They know that a lot of the material that relates to their grandparents and their great grandparents is sitting somewhere in the United States or in some other province in the country. And, and uh, they don't have any ask, uh, access to it. And um, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very open wound. And so everything that must be done now in collaboration or uh, with re returning the uh, rights of, of people to maintain their privacy and to maintain their um, authority over their cultural knowledge uh, has to be handled very sensitively and very carefully in order to make any kind of um, rapprochement. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential. Well, thank you, Stephen and Mario. I think um, building on that, I was thinking when you were talking about uh, the seamstresses, uh, Stephen, and how they build the hood, but Mario also the training of the people uh, in the process of you know documenting uh, cultural artifacts. Um, what 
comes to my mind is this idea of skill development. Storytelling as the means has been used uh, in, in the past and still being used for knowledge transfer, for you know, teaching people what to do. So are we now doing a different kind of a skill transfer? Um, how does that change with the introduction of the digital? Uh, for example, Stephen, when you gave the example of the seamstress, it's probably a, a very traditional way of uh, making objects that is being transferred still or being explored still, mm -hmm. being kept alive. Um, whereas in the digital, probably a documentation of those, does it usher the urge to you know, probably learn about the skills or uh, what is the and <clears throat> I, I, I want to probably in my mind, I'm questioning when we introduce the digital, do we, is it provocative enough to help people, you know, understand that this is a cultural artifact or cultural way of making and uh, encourage them to do it? Um, well, I'll, I'll just give a quick answer. That's, that's a profound question. Uh, I um, observed that during this long recreation process, um, there was um, there was quite a bit of uh, video documentation of the process, which is really important because that will be part of a training module that can go from where uh, the Cree Cultural Institute is located in Ujibugumu to other communities of that uh, people. And, um, the other thing is that the recovery of information through storytelling, through even dreams, is something that excites people. And I'll give you an example. We have some hoods there, women's hoods, that we were able to acquire various ways in the collection up there. Um, but none of them have a name attached to them. Each one was collected by a missionary or something. And, you know, they didn't care who made it. It was brought as a sort of a, uh, you know, just a generalized expression of those people. And yet we found one in Laval in a small museum just outside of Montreal, a hood. We looked into that hood. And through oral history, we were able to establish the woman who wore that three or four generations ago. Now, that was a spectacular moment for those people. And they had a huge gathering in a place called Mistisni, where that woman had been the wife of a chief. And the hood was brought up and shown to those people. And all of a sudden that hood took on a huge value that for young people and people who just looked at it could never have done. So you see how important making that connection is. And then it's a living person. And then it's people that are talked about. And then they say, well, that hood is really something. Wow. And it changes the whole notion of a museum artifact as a mute uh, object lying in a case to something that is a, is a physical object that almost has a life of its own. It's like a living presence for those people. Now, that doesn't... I'm not negating the digital at all because the digital is a process of working with these things and Cree people are very interested in digital uh, recording and digital creation and all kinds of other things. And those will all continue to take their place in those institutions. Uh, but the way they'll be integrated with people's uh, interests and personal uh, experiences is what's really exciting. Absolutely. Mario, would you like to say something on those lines? 
Yeah, I, I, as I was listening to Steve and, you know, the hood, and I was, I was actually thinking about, uh, I'm going to put it on the chat box, about my friend Brett Levy in Australia. So he's an Aboriginal out of Australia, and I met him in 1997. <clears throat> and he created this virtual environment uh, in 1997 from all places <laughs> and times about <laughs> He created this virtual environment of Sydney before it was colonized, right, by the by the British, and he had so much, you know, he had so much uh, contribution from different Aboriginal communities. So they kind of uh, replicated the sound of animals in the jungle, you know, in, in the forest there. They recreated the landscape and everything. And then, of course, in those days, the Oculus drives didn't exist, so you had to wear these <laughs> huge things. And, and I think that that kind of killed the idea. But if you see uh, some of his new work in the virtual zone lines, in the Billy B uh, lab, they're actually using augmented reality, et cetera, and other apps. So they have really evolved and it has become a really interesting initiative. And I think that you see there that, you know, uh, anybody is capable of using digital tools. But of course, we enter into another discussion about opportunities for learning and how those opportunities are offered. Um, I was recently uh, in Colombia, in the Amazon jungle, and I had the opportunity to work with some of the park rangers there. And we showed them how to use photogrammetry uh, to record some rock art panels. And um, I have to admit that I was really happy. <laughs> so they were very excited because, you know, they, they were always like 14 people coming and then doing great photographs. And actually Google Arts and Culture has been there now there is a French company going there uh, and there might be other ones because there, there is a big art article on, on the Guardian and the National Geographic magazine about these rock art panels in Colombia. But usually the park rangers only bring the people to see the, the panels, but they don't, they don't do anything else. So why, why cannot we teach the, the, them how to do it? And they will be able actually to record most of the panels more than any other, you know, foreign company or, or, or elsewhere. So that, that, I think that's, that's my point with training. You know, technologies are becoming more accessible. Um, tools are more accessible. Training can be done in different ways. Uh, you don't need to be physically there in many cases. So I think that we need to look into those venues of opportunities and see how, how they, they play out. Um, I think uh, to add to that, um, to kind of get prompt another discussion, that idea of like um, technology that's more available. And uh, Mario, you showed um, the scanning, the documentation work that you did on your phone, um, which is quite incredible that now we're able to do that. And so um, I'm just, uh, I guess, how how do we give that ability? And and I mean, so Stephen, you were talking with the iPads and giving putting in the hands. Um, is this way of doing it, um, what can we gain from putting it more in other people's hands? Um, Mario, would you like to start? Yeah, so, I, you know, actually, I don't remember where I read this, but there is a there is a kind of a heritage place or a World Heritage site. I don't remember where in the coastal areas. And they're actually putting places where you can put your phone to take a photo of the coastal line. And then this, you can, you can send the photo to this kind of, uh, website or I don't know you upload it somewhere and it's used for monitoring the coastal line you know for climate change and so on and I found that well of course I mean we can discuss about the technological aspects of that but I found that to be really interesting and useful you know for a particular issue right um, I, I have to admit something that I did once you know I was very excited going to a church in Peru and I took some pictures of the inside and then I put them on my Instagram account and then the client uh, that had brought us there was really angry and said, you know, I should remove the photos because the paintings of the church are very prompt to be stolen because they are very valuable. So I realized that sometimes people don't really think about what they're digitizing and how they are sharing it. And I wonder if we could do some, some kind of, you know, when you use this kind of polycam application to do your LiDAR scanning, that it has some kind of message that says, well, remember, if you're scanning something, you need to meet these ethical <laughs> commitments, you know, before, before posting it anywhere, or if you're posting it, you should follow this and this other 
uh, regulations. I wonder because I mean, this is going to be happening more and more. Um, actually, there is a, an article by someone about this Ukrainian uh, portal that is using the iPhone 13 Pros to collect data from heritage sites in Ukraine, you know, for their protection, which of course you can, you can be a little bit judgmental about the, the quality of the, of the records, but nevertheless, you know, it can be useful. Um, the interaction could be there. I, I don't know exactly how to, I mean, we also have machine learning, deep learning, things that could be uh, also helpful. There, there's another thing too. I, I agree with Mario. Um, there's another thing which is called showing commitment. Um, outsiders coming into, uh, say, an indigenous community in the past were often um, stimulated by their own interests. And, you know, going back to their own universities or, or wherever they came from. Uh, the companies and so forth, and um, with a, with a really very sketchy knowledge or appreciation for what was going on in the places that they went to, and I think demonstrating through uh, through commitment uh, a real sense of um, you know, in, in um, Mario's case, a real sense of a global responsibility. And in this, the sense I was giving a local responsibility is really very important. We set up a, a committee very early on at the Cree Cultural Institute to review research proposals from outside. And as you can imagine, after being ignored for hundreds of years, uh, these people were very um, careful about who they wanted to admit to do this or to do that. And um, I remember that early on in the process, they looked at these proposals and then they just rejected them. And I was feeling a little bit protective about the continuation of research, you know, and thinking, well, maybe this person didn't word it so well, or, you know, maybe they're, but really what they were looking for was a connection. Who does that person know in the community? Who is that person talking with in the community? Who is going to be um, monitoring and also who's going to be giving and taking? in this relationship. And as soon as we started to get proposals, which were inevitable to come, where people had said, this is what we know, this is who we know, this is what we'd like to achieve together, then that committee could, could begin to approve some of these things. So, I mean, it's not rocket science, really. It's, it's just to say, what are the interests of the various people that be involved in this? And clearly articulate it. And if it's a regional or a local situation, how precisely is the local community gonna benefit from this activity? And of course, in the past, it wasn't so important that that took place because there was some other center or someone that was going to really achieve something through this. And um, so whole issues of language, issues of priorities, issues of uh, seeking permission from the people who are right involved, like each of the trap lines in the North have someone, an, an elder, who's responsible for that trap line and may not be even going out anymore because they're too old, but still have a certain authority over that land and the animals that are there. And not to be talking to that person prior to presenting your proposal uh, just won't work anymore. So. Um, I think it's possible for research to continue 
and new media research uh, particularly to continue. But it, it has to be done in a new mode and a, a much more complementary mode. Yes, and I, I don't know, Steve, I, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in a webinar series of the, there is a new center in Korea on World Heritage Presentation and Interpretation. And I was listening to the uh, International Council of, of Museums uh, president and apparent repatriation of, of you know, heritage um, assets is something that is happening, you know, mm -hmm. internationally. Like I, when I was in Colombia, one of my colleagues went to Germany to, to talk to one of the museums, ethnographic museums, to return some pieces to Colombia. And they were in serious talks. And this is happening worldwide. And I wonder how you know, does it, this could also happen in Canada. I was very shocked, but also like, you know, surprised when I went to the Museum of Alberta, you know, in Edmonton, and I saw that, you know, that meteorite that is actually from one of the indigenous communities and it's, you know, it's placed in the museum. It's, it's wonderful the way they display it. They put it intentionally in the part that you don't need to pay to enter the museum. So anybody can go. But it still is there, right? It still is in a building which doesn't belong to the context of where it was before. And I was wondering, like, with new technologies, you know, like digital uh, fabrication, Katie and Palavi knows this very well from our lab. I mean, we could, in the museum, we can just keep, a, um, a, um, you know, facsimile, and then we can have the real one where it was, right? That's true. Uh, I can give you an update on that because just last week I had a discussion with Douglas Cardinal, who's the architect who's been hired to um, develop a plan for a new site for that meteorite. And the new site for the meteorite is where it fell, which is now in a farmer's field outside of Edmonton. And um, it's going to be placed there in a context where people can come and see it and learn about its original uh, fall and it, the, the na native people's relationship to it and kind of meditate on it. And um, so that's the plan. It's moving, it was in Toronto for years and years and years where it was taken by a Methodist minister. Then it was returned to the museum in Edmonton. And now it's going to go out to the land where it has its most uh, closest connections and be programmed out there. So that's a very good story uh, <laughs> of uh, sort of a return to uh, first uh, principles. Yeah, I know that that's, that sounds excellent. But I wonder if, you know, you could do like a digital, you know, a, a, a new fabrication right of the object and then you can see it in the museum so then people cannot go to this area to see it they, they can still see it i yes. you know it's like it's interesting that that people in the facsimile business don't think about these ideas they think more about you know let's make the replica of tutankhamon and then have visitors going <laughs> but don't think about this aspect of you know the repatriation of the object right mm -hmm. like you can mm -hmm. yeah now, Mario, does that limit us from planning a, a, a trip to somewhere? You know, oh, I can see it virtually. Uh, maybe I, you know, I, I can go in, look at a building and then, but it's very different going on site. Oh, do you think that, oh. it's always my question, does it um, encourage you and inspire you to go to a certain place or does it deter you and say oh i have already seen it i know how it feels from inside but you don't i mean and but probably well you know that. yeah you know um i i feel i am a privileged person right because i can travel and go to places and work in really exciting projects so i wouldn't be the right person to say you know the, the virtual will replace the the original because I can go to the original because I can, right? I have the means and so on. But I think that that beyond that aspect of, you know, you visit the virtual so that you can, you are not going to go, you know, you're not gonna go to Venice because you already saw the 3D model of Venice. I don't think so, right? You, you are gonna see that 
if you have the opportunity. But then we have to think that that virtual, uh, you know, digital assets could play a very good role in other aspects. Like um, I was talking to one of my colleagues here in Italy about the fact of using virtual reality to for teachers, you know, like to help teachers uh, be more acquainted with digital technologies so they can, you know, they can show, you know, the when they are talking about history, they can use virtual reality to teach students, kids about how that place looked, you know, reconstruction of some kind of whatever uh, heritage place. And he says that, you know, teachers don't have the skills, but they could acquaint the, and why they don't have the skills? Because the, the, the apps to create these environments are very complex. So can we make something simple? You know, like what doctors use now, you know, they use this augmented reality to see the parts of the body. Can we not do that also for, for historic places? And that could also go to the point of Steve, you know, like showing, you know, more about our First Nation communities because I, I, my kids who went to Canada in their, you know, in their teen, in their teener age uh, years, they didn't learn anything about the First Nations in Canada. I mean, not at all. So how can we, you know, use digital technologies to apply to improve that, that could be really interesting. So I don't see it as, you know, replacing the site, mm -hmm. but I see it as enhancing, you know? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to, yeah. sorry, just I just, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna say, ahead, I wanted to add to that, just um, that my, my always feeling about it is that if we create the digital environments and represent it somewhere on the internet and people are like, wow, this is incredible, then they want to go, whereas like, if you just hear about something, well, you might not even hear about it. And so it all of a sudden becomes like if um, for children, especially if they see um, Paris in a video game, they're like, um, then when they go to Paris, they're like, I've seen this church. And then they look at the detail, I've climbed up this wall. And so it's, it can, and maybe it actually encourages it, but it does bring up the question of, um, is the fact that the actual place, the location, like the, the physical environment lost in those digital replicas or or is there enough of their representation through like digital form that still informs you of the connection to place so and, I guess that's my question adding to katie's and connecting it to what stephen has had said earlier this idea about storytelling or dreaming uh, which leaves a little bit up to your imagination so you know if you, the invisible cities if you've read that and you know you make a mental picture of it through the stories that you hear or you know probably when when you have a dream there is an imaginative construct that happens do do we think that uh, there's place for that in the di digital in some way i'd like to say that i think there is um and the way i look at it and, and beginning more and more to look at it is um, people should begin to think of objects as having a life. And around that life are stories and histories and all kinds of interesting things that you can't necessarily deliver physically on site. But with a digital um digital base and, and digital surround, you can make that object lying there come to life in a way that you couldn't physically. And I think that that is really the wonderful opportunity. And I'm sure Maria knows of many, many places in which these digital uh, constructs bring a historical site really to life. And um, we're always so conscious of this divide between the animate and the inanimate. But when it comes to thinking about objects and their role, it, it behooves us. It, it, it really suggests we should be thinking of this thing more as something that has a life. And if you think that way, then you wouldn't just put up a picture of a person and just expect people to, you know, intuit somehow who this person is and what they've done. 
And that's the way we should be looking at objects because that's the way they perform in actual life. And if you've seen people start to cry when they see for the first time a particular object, you know that there is something going on that we don't usually attribute to objects. But it's a very good exercise if we do, because um, it's closer to the effect they have on human beings. And in some cases, it's such a powerful uh, presence that uh, you have a hard time going back to thinking of it as something made of bone or cloth or wood. And uh, I think if you treat things that way, then, and the digital world is a way of uh, enriching that physical experience. Fantastic. I, I, I don't want to uh, dominate this, but I just want to say to Mario, I remember, you know, going to these things called Sonne Lumière. At, at our archaeological sites and so forth, where you sit back in a chair. I mean, it's a very early <laughs> form of interpretation, but there's music and, and there's a spotlight that goes on one part of the temple or something. And then, and then some voice in the back is, um, you know, it may seem crude today, but I think it was a lovely way given the technology that existed when these were popular of bringing places to light. I don't know what you think of them. No, uh, that, that reveals our age, Steve. I also <laughs> yes, <those>. it does. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I went to actually some sites in India and Egypt. And I saw, I went to the Santon Lumiere because it was the only thing available, right? That interacted right. That, you know, right. and presented the sites in a different way because otherwise, you see this pile of stones, right? And you didn't know exactly what they were. And, and I, I really like, I'm going to use your quote about objects have lives now that we have technologies. I'm going to use that for my teaching. <laughs> I Good. find it really powerful. So yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to um, to follow up on what Stephen was saying to ask Mario about when you're doing the documentation and like that idea of objects having life. Mario, how do you determine what like level of detail you need to do for things? Because I imagine that's where that life gets shown, where it becomes more than just a photo, but it becomes the virtual life of the object. So how do you how do you determine what to show life in? Or, or well, what you not know, to show, I would say. <laughs> I mean, to be Actually, very frank, to what to absent, I think is absenting even a thought. Yeah, you know, doing it deliberately so that it would have a more heavy presence because of the absenting. I'm just, that's an add on to Katie's question. Well, you know, I, I mean, for all our jobs, usually we do it for conservation purposes, you know, to understand the condition of the sites. And then eventually this could lead into a digital storytelling app or, or, or application. So usually we looked at we looked at the level of detail in terms of what we want to understand. So, you know, we, we have been working, as you know, in many places that they have decorated surfaces like the rock arts or the paintings. In that level of detail, we need to see the cracks and the, you know, we need to see the biological growth, like the lichens on the, on the surfaces. So we need a very qualitative uh, recording. So we do very detailed recording. And then that gradually becomes into another so, you know, I, I think that the acquisition of data is not, not that critical. You can, actually delete, you can actually acquire data in a very high level of detail, if you have the means, of course, but in relatively short time. Now, I always ask, you know, I, I, the client, what is it exactly that they want? Because, of course, one thing is acquiring, one thing is producing. So when you produce, that takes some time. So if we want to have, you know, just a, rudimentary three-dimensional model of the site that will be going into some website. Of course, we're gonna dilute the interpretation of the, of the um, irregularities of the, of the site. 
and that will let, but, but we have to be very careful because we are making an interpretation. To give you an example, you know, we worked in a project in which we had this temple wall paintings and they were not accessible to the public. <clears throat> and then we did very sophisticated photogrammetry. And to, to transfer that into the game engine, no way. I mean, that many triangles uh, creating the mesh wouldn't work. So the student, the researcher that was working on that project found a way to have it visually detailed, but not physically or digitally detailed. So when you go into the game engine, you look, it seems like it's really detailed, but it's not because the number of pixels, I mean, I am not an expert as you know, in, in those type of things, but that, that fulfilled the purpose because it was a visualization issue. Now for the Getty, where we were working in this project, we produce a scale one to 10 of the ortho images of the world painting so they could see the cracks. So it always depends what is the presentation means, you know, how is it going to be presented? And I think that the level of detail, of course, is important, but I think that, of course, we need to guarantee the highest degree of collection of data, if we can. Because sometimes we don't know when we are ever going to go back to those places. And, and we also have invested a substantial amount of funding to be able to do, go there, right? Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. And then what Palavi says, of what not to show, yes, looting, looting of archeological sites or historic places is something that happens. There is an active community seeking antiques and uh, heritage objects, which are valuable. So we need to be very careful because we are just providing someone with the lead way to get access to those islands, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I have one more question, which is about um, kind of, I guess, who who decides what's important? And and you mentioned the client, and then I know for like heritage sites, like for UNESCO, it's it's the governments that decide what it is. But how how do we um, like? And and when we look at the collection of objects before that were put in other museums before, um, like as part of um, like appropriation, but like. How do we decide who should say what's important for us to to document and share and tell the stories of? And yeah, so like, how do we decide that? I think, you know, I think the acquisition of data, and I think Steve was talking about oral testimonies not being important before and now increasingly very important. So I think that those are, you know, intangible aspects of uh, any site should be acquired somehow. Oral testimonies, one part of them. There are other aspects that can be can be collected. Um, in my case, I, I usually do not decide what needs to be collected. We collect as much as we can, right? But, but then the presentation is, is a decision that is made. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes the decisions are made by interest of different groups. Um, you know, I, I think that, that the presentation of sites and the, what they call interpretation and presentation, those two aspects. Uh, if, you, if you're not acquainted in my presentation, I talk about the NAMI charter for NICOMOS. That's a good good um, way to go and see what they talk about. Although it's, it's from 2008, so technologies have advanced a lot. Mm -hmm. But in the NAMI charter, it talks about participatory events, so participatory, and that the interpretation engages with the community. Okay, so the interpretation is not a process of the scientist collecting the information and then presenting what he thinks is the meaning of the site. It means that it's a participatory activity with different groups of people. I had the opportunity to participate in some projects in Cuenca in Ecuador. I have a good friend and they work a lot in participatory events. So if they have like a historic building, they meet with the different stakeholders and they kind of try to identify what the values of the site are from different people and what they need to be recording, what they need to be presenting. And it takes a long time. I mean, it's not an easy process, but I think that that's, that's also something interesting. I mean, I am not a sociologist or, or anthropologist and I won't claim to be one, but I think that those participatory events should be, probably Steve can talk more about this. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just mention that, um... There are various um, systems of value 
with regard to objects. And one of the big ones is aesthetic. And uh, a lot of museums, uh, great museums, collected things from say indigenous communities in North America based on a separate and quite well-developed sense of aesthetics over something. Uh, and because museums used to collect for comparative reasons, they would collect 20 of these things and then say, this is the most beautiful. So this is the one we're gonna share with the public. And this has gone on forever in big museums. But that sense of aesthetics is something that's generated outside the community for the most part. And you can go to school and you can learn about it. And people will say, that's a great piece and that's not so great and so forth and so forth. But let's ask another question. What's the biography of that object? Now we've got a different sense of value. This one, we don't know who made it. We don't know who collected it maybe. We don't know anything about it. We just know it's likely from the 19th century and it's likely from this area of the country. But this one was collected by so-and-so from so-and-so. It represented this. It participated in so many ceremonies. It was part of an agreement like that. Now we ask the question again, what, what may be the most um, vocal of, uh, of these objects? It's obviously the one with the biography. And that changes the, the value. So when you're selecting for your exhibition, for example, if you use this other criteria, you're gonna choose a different object, but that object is going to have more of a voice. It's going to have more of a historical significance and everything else. It's not anymore just taking things, putting them on the table, comparing them, and then saying this is more beautiful or this is more intense or this uses more materials or something like that. That's a simple way of, of, uh, of looking at it. But I think it, it's happening more and more uh, all the time because this criteria that I just mentioned is the one that takes advantage of local people, their memories, their, uh, their sequences of value, which should be part of the object's history and biography and part of the presentation. You know, a lot of things in North America were made for sale because museums at the turn of the 20th century were just going crazy, sending people out to collect and collect and collect. And very soon the uh, carvers and painters and uh, traditional artists in these communities knew what people wanted. And so they reproduced things over and over again because that's the one that the collector chose. And you have to sort that out now and say, okay, yeah, I've seen that before. And you know, that, that's a beautifully made thing. But this thing is something that we know something about and we're learning more and more about. And um, we should give that its due. We should give that its importance. Yes. Yeah, that's Sorry, Katie, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that's, um, that's a very great way of looking at it. Um, Mario, did you have something else to say about it? Yeah, no, I was really thrilled when, when, <laughs> when Steve was talking about the biography of the object because uh, as I was telling, you know, when, when we did that trip to Colombia last month, and we we're working into these 12,000 years panels, which were made by indigenous community, but we have no way or clue what they were drawing about. And we would never know what are the interpretation of those uh, different elements. I mean, we can see there are animals, yeah. we can see there are some people, some elements dancing, et cetera. So you can kind of somehow guess, but there is no community that you can ask to see what they mean. And so, so the Guardian, which is this prominent newspaper, called that place the, um, the 16th chapel of the Amazon. And that really 
triggered me to think, well, why is it the Sixteen Chapel? Of, why do we need to, to call something the Sixteen Chapel to, to raise awareness for people to go and see it? No, not for what it is, but, but because it's associated to something that is more Western, right? So I was really thrilled about it. I don't know what you think about that kind of comparison, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting. It's interesting when you turn it around and you say the Sistine Chapel is the Incan uh, palace of so-and-so. You know, it's yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, noting the time, um, what we'll do, I'll do now is see if any, um, if either of you have a final statement or anything that you would like to make before we uh, wrap up this session. My final statement is uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. And it's been a pleasure to uh, discuss, uh, however briefly, the work of Mario uh, and to learn about it. And uh, I look forward to uh, tuning in for some of the other presentations in the series. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I echo the sentiment of Steve. It was really cool uh, to talk to him and also to, you know, to be with Katie and Pallavi mm -hmm. from our Seams times. I hope that, uh, we have the opportunity to grab something more in person <laughs> later on in, in the weeks to come. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly where Steve is located. If you're in Ottawa, maybe that will be actually quite uh, quite interesting because I, I really like your, your the presentation. I think that the concept of negotiating is really interesting. I really congratulate you with you know this series of webinars. Very engaging. I, I hope that we, you know, get the recordings and then I can share it with my students. I there was a lot of actually here in the workshop I am. There were there were many people who were really interesting, but they are now working on the on the workshop, so they cannot attend. So maybe they can see it later. So I think that you know these activities are really useful, and uh, I hope I can contribute somehow in the future again. Okay, so thanks a lot. Yes, um, I wanted to say thank you to both of you very much. This conversation has been. Um, incredible. Next time I pick up an object, I'm going to think a lot more about it and about the history of it instead of just what it looks like to me. Um, and then just in general, like going to sites and how we document and look and record all of that, there's questions to be asked. Um, I'm going to let Pallavi finalize the, the goodbyes by saying where they can find content after, since you know that a bit more. Um, but just thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the people attending both here as well as through YouTube. And, um, and thank you to any future viewers of it, that, uh, since it will be available online. So Pallavi. Oh, and just a huge thank you to both of you, Stephen and Mario. And um, uh, the recordings will be available on mindfulhabitats.ca website and also on the YouTube channel. Um, so you, I, I'll send that over to all of you. Uh, but easiest way to go there is mindfulhabitats.ca. Uh, and under the conversations, you will have the link to this series. And we are we are back next Thursday. So I just wanted to give everyone a reminder that we'll be back next Thursday at from 9 a.m. to 11. Um, and the session is called uh, The uh, Soundscapes and the Story of Place with Vincent and Rissani and David Drury. So please uh, log in at that time with us. And thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.